this is a picture by Rembrandt of the Apostle Paul. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, Dr. Chin's uh, reflection last week. Uh, you sent the same kind of consternation uh, in Paul holding his head in his hands. Uh, uh, Derek had mentioned how much he was struggling over being away from me mm-hmm. last week. Uh, but for a different reason, I think he has every reason to be thankful. Uh, you may have heard how President Trump compared himself to President Lincoln, saying he had it worse. I've heard Derek say he's had it worse than the Apostle Paul, but I beg to differ. Uh, but uh, regardless of what you think, okay, Carrie, if you could go to the next, not the next slide, but the words on this slide, please. The Apostle Paul was under house arrest. This is perhaps around 62 AD. Uh, he had never visited the, the church in Colossae. It's east of Ephesus in Asia Minor. He's actually writing, according to uh, traditional accounts, from Rome, where he's under house arrest, his first Roman imprisonment. And while Paul's under house arrest, and as Pastor Avery and uh, Dr. Derek had indicated previously, uh, he longs to meet them. He longs to be with them. Uh, and one thing that arises here is a major concern for Paul, it's he's receiving reports. He hadn't planted this church, but he cares for this church. And he's receiving reports that this church is facing a grave danger with false teaching. And it could do them in. He's under house arrest, but they are potentially going to experience spiritual cardiac arrest. And we're calling this uh, the coronavirus from a spiritual vantage point with the Colossian heresy. So, uh, Gary, if you would, please. Could you read with me, please? You, you don't have to unmute, but if you could read out loud. I'm reading from the ESV. Hopefully you can see it. My screen's close to me, so I can see it fine. But uh, our text this afternoon is from Colossians chapter 2, picking up from where Derek had finished off with verse 7 last week. So please read with me, verse 8 through 15. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you've been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal commands or demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Colossians 2, 8 through 15. May God bless his word to our hearts and our minds and our hands and feet to live it out. So we're going to reflect further on this. And uh, thank you, Carrie. Uh, So I'm going to highlight some words here that I think are key in this passage and bear significance for the letter as a whole. And that will help us get at the problem that the Colossian church's experience with this false teaching that really is the cause for Paul to write this letter. So, again, you see this text that we just read. Can you see, okay, I hope you can, uh, the different colors, and uh, hopefully it doesn't block out the print. But do you see that word or phrase, rather, elemental spirits of the world? Do you see that there? elemental spirits of the world. Um, It could be also understood 
there as rulers and authorities in the spiritual realms. I take these to be the demonic domain, uh, or at least in part, the demonic domain uh, that Christ is in warfare with. In verse 15, the same grade, elemental spirits of the world, all rule and authority, which is not exclusively what I take to be the fallen angels for Paul, um, but it includes that, that Christ has rulership over them. And in verse 15, that same gray uh, um, box, the rulers and authorities. So please keep that in mind. Also, this wording in verse 9 and verse 10, whole fullness in yellow and fiddle. And we're going to look at chapter 1 today as well. I'm going to ask you to help me out in looking at some verses there because this theme of elemental spirits of the world, rulers and authorities, appear over and over again in the first two chapters. So too with fullness and fill. And I'm going to have to come back to those words. This is really deep Pauline theology that he's articulating to this church. And if he could do it then, why not do it in the 21st century for us? He has much to teach us today. Also, some other words that I'm highlighting here. Paul's favorite expression in my estimation, at least the one that appears over and over again in his writings, is in him, in him, en Christo, in Christ. Participation in the life of Christ is what moves Paul. It's what drives Paul. Not simply doing things for Christ, but doing them in Christ. That is key to his thinking. And then he talks about with him. Same general idea. Having been buried with him. The Colossian church is buried with Christ. They are raised with him. And it's through faith. All of this is key for Paul. Even as he's dealing with this idea that theirs is a circumcision made without hands. It's the circumcision of Christ. Then that same gold or brownish gold box, uncircumcision of your flesh. So I'm just highlighting some words here. I haven't unpacked how they all connect together. But if you could bear with me, I'll go to the next slide and then come back to this and try and sum things up, okay? So here are some key words or themes in Colossians 1 and 2. And I would ask that you would be looking, whatever translation you have, and you can unmute. Uh, we just have a few minutes here to go through this. But I'm asking you specifically, after I list these words or these themes, that you would look at Colossians 1 9, Colossians 1 15 to 20, Colossians 20, sorry, 1 24 to 29. And then also Colossians 2, 1 through 4. So we've looked at these passages, but for me to unpack further what I'm getting at today, I have to build on what's been shared and go back to the previous biblical texts as well to get at chapter 2, 8 through 15. So the themes or words are mystery, hidden, revealed. We've already looked at this full fullness filled we haven't gotten at the issue yet of wisdom knowledge and understanding but we'll deal with it we've already mentioned highlighted in verses 8 to 15 of chapter 2 powers and principalities chapter 1 deals with shadow and substance so there's a lot here and we only have three hours to go through it today uh, we'll start out here at Zoom, <laughs> then I'm going to go to Skype, and after I get kicked off Skype, I'm going to Twitter, but we have three hours, okay? So, uh, Colossians 1, verse 9, uh, any words there, or what do you see there that might pick up on these themes here? I'm only focusing on these words and these themes for now. Anyone? I ask God to fill you. Yes. He asked God to fill them. Daryl, do you want to, I think that was Daryl. Daryl, do you want to 
give the, the statement if you want to quote it there, please? We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Yeah, to fill you all the wisdom, all the knowledge, all the understanding, fullness, fill. That's what he's getting at here. Because there's a problem that they're going for fullness somewhere else. And that's going to take us back to the coronavirus issue because they're losing their breath, finding fullness in the wrong place. They're filling up on poisonous fluids rather than fullness in Christ. And that will kill them. Uh, other words, other, um, other uh, quotations, please, that get at these words or themes, please. So, sorry, Paul, but, you know, in verse 15 to 20, it, it talks about in him again, right? So, verse 16 and verse 17. Exactly. So, that theme of in him, and no, no need to apologize, Daryl, thank you. Otherwise, we'll take it up at Twitter within a few minutes. But um, uh, other thoughts, thank you. In him, in him, you find that over and over in Christ. You find that in Ephesians. You find it elsewhere, but you find it in Colossians, too. Um, Paul, verse 19, mm -hmm. for in him... All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Yes, thank you, Paul. So, again, you see this, that you see in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2, all the fullness, what Paul just said, verse 19, right? All the fullness is in him. Paul's making a point here. He keeps repeating these expressions. It's pleroma, the Greek, not to worry about that, but fullness, pleroma, Christ embodied. That's what Paul's bleeding for. That's what he's willing to die for. Um, thank you, Paul. What is the shadow and what is the substance? I don't know the answer to that, but I know that in verse 17, <laughs> it talks about thrones or dominions or yes. rulers. Or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Yeah, through him. Thank you, Jane. Through him, for him. All principalities, all rules, all authority, uh, before they were fallen. So these these angelic beings that they're worshiping or tempted to worship in Colossae, Jesus is Lord over them. Why are they submitting to them instead of Christ? This is the problem that they're facing. And it's not just the demonic, but I think that's part of what's going on. And Paul is simply trying to encourage them to look to Christ. How about shadow and substance? Anything? Um, in verse 13, it talks about how he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Yes. So he's rescued us. And again, I think in part, why might they be going back to that dominion of darkness um, is part of what's going on here, I think. How about this, too? Let me just add a few, and thank you. I, I didn't catch who had said that, but thank you very much. Um, 26, because we talked about hidden, revealed, mystery. Verse 26, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Again, mystery, hidden. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So you see this idea of mystery hidden, revealed here. Again, what is going on for Paul's thinking in terms of the concern he has with the church in Colossae? So, um, unless anyone has anything further to say, uh, again, shadow and substance. The substance belongs to Christ. Anything else is a shadow. If you were to look at maybe chapter 2, 1 to 4, where he says, um, In Christ, verse 3, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom. Again, he talks about that theme. But elsewhere, he talks about the substance belongs to Christ. Everything else is passing. It is shadow in comparison. So what's going on here? And this is where we're going to deal with this concern he has in terms of this false teaching. And this is one of the high water points or high water points for Paul theologically in his writings in the New Testament. So Carrie, if you could go there, I'm going to try and connect 
the dots for us in short order. Next slide, please. So here are the major problems going on in the Church of Colossae. There is an esoteric, it's like a very um, unique form. Um, uh, it's not just unique. When I say esoteric, very ritualistic, very um, magical perhaps, form of mystical experience. And I'm all for a certain kind of biblical mysticism. I think Paul was a biblical mystic when he talks about being in Christ through the Spirit. I have no trouble with that, but this is a different kind of mysticism. And there was a certain kind of Jewish teaching that I think was bound up with Greek philosophy, because he talks about watch out for certain kinds of philosophy, not all kinds of philosophy. Paul was a philosopher, but philosophy that would take us away from Christ. And there was this strange form, ritualistic, um, magical perhaps form of mysticism where people were seeking to ascend to God and it was a combination I think of Jewish and Greek thought seeking to ascend to God through angelic realms the angels were seen in the ancient world to oversee worlds if you've ever read Daniel and I know you have uh, the angel says Michael had to come to help me Daniel I was on my way but I had a fight with the prince of Persia and Greece. He wasn't talking about human princes. In the ancient world, they saw angels as being over these cities, these nations, and over planets. And so you would ascend through the various stages of the heavenlies to get to God's throne with all the principalities and powers and aeons. But you'd have to go through these angelic realms, and these could be very abusive powers. And they were waging um, war against humans. They were beating up on people. And in this context, Paul is concerned about the fact that these Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians may have been mixing a certain kind of Jewish and philosophical Greek thought, pagan thought, and they were mixing in such a way where circumcision was being perhaps used against Gentiles that they had to be circumcised. And the angelic powers were using the law to beat up on people. And these weren't God's angels. These were fallen angels. I hope you're following me on this because if you want to understand Colossians, you've got to understand this. You can't go around this. This is not window dressing. You miss the message of what Paul's after, why he's willing to bleed for Christ and bleed for these people, which he will over and over again do. Because this teaching is abusing them, and it's sucking the life out of them. They need a respirator. They're facing the possibility of cardiac arrest because these demonic beings are taking the life breath out of them with oppressing them, using the law against its best aims. Hebrews tells us that the law was mediated to us by angels, not just Hebrews, but elsewhere in Scripture. In Colossians 2.18, I quote here, let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism, where they beat their body, and worship angels going on in detail about visions. That's what I meant by the esoteric, vision after vision, that wasn't really necessary and actually took them off course. That kind of esoteric. He said, this is warping your spirituality. It's taking the life breath out of you and it is going to lead to cardiac arrest. And he writes this from house arrest in Rome. So they are in danger, some of them, of worshiping fallen angels as they seek to ascend to the heavenlies to God's throne, rather than focus on Christ, who is descended from God's throne, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and you've been given fullness of Christ. Don't seek to find fullness through these angelic powers and all the fullness of heaven beyond Christ, but only in Christ. Is, and this is a rhetorical question, but I hope the 
this is making sense. Is it making sense to you? This is key to Paul's letter and his argument. And he's trying to guard them from being wit, bewitched by this false teaching. And he's passionate about it because he cares for them. We should not worship angels just like from this picture in Revelation where John bows before the angel instead of Christ. And he says, don't worship me. I'm just an angel. Worship Christ. So next slide, please, Carrie. The resultant dangers is respiratory failure and the potential for cardiac arrest, just like with the coronavirus. Take it too far with the pneumonia that sets in and it fills both lungs and people stop breathing with these fluids that are poisonous to our system ultimately, rather than being filled with the Spirit of God. And the result here for them who don't listen to Paul's words is potentially cardiac arrest. So, moving forward into this argument and where Paul seeks to lead them. Next slide, please. Now, this is something taken from a blog post. If you, if you want to look further into this, I wrote a blog post for this sermon um, yesterday at Patheos, and I'm just going to quote from it. Paul seeks to conquer this virus by capturing the Colossian church imagination and calling them, to use my language, but I, I think this fits metaphorically, and calling them to breathe in Christ, to be in Christ, to permeate in Christ. Paul presents Jesus as the physician of the soul, who does house calls, who is a phenomenal bedside manner, who pays the bill for us so that we can be seen. Who would you rather be seen by? Jesus or the Colossian heresies, elemental spirits or demons who parade in white, who are supposed to be mediators of the law, the spiritual equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath, but who manipulate the law and use it against these people, say, you got to be circumcised, or you have to follow these Sabbath rituals and such, which you'll find later next week that we'll talk about. Don't drink, don't chew, don't date girls who do type of thing. You know, this is what Paul is getting at here. We're missing the point. That's the shadow. Christ is the substance. So how does Paul encourage the Colossian church to respond? What was and is his cure for the virus? According to Paul, the cure involves taking seriously the fact that all the fullness of deity is in bodily form in Jesus. As Paul earlier said from chapter 1, it's found there, and it's also in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2. And that they have been given fullness in Jesus Christ. For in him, all the fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him. The fullness is not beyond them in this ethereal, ritualistic, magical domain of these angelic powers over these worlds that are beating these people up as they seek to ascend. And it includes these principalities and powers of these quote-unquote angelic dominions. No, it is close to home. We don't have to ascend. Christ has descended to us. He is in our midst as Jesus is the Word in flesh. All the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The cure involves setting our minds on things above, as we'll see in chapter 3, 1 to 3, where the incarnate Jesus, who had dwelt on earth in our midst, is seated at the right hand of God. Our lives are hidden in Jesus. So, next slide, please. This is the hospital that before my mother passed away, um, this is the hospital she was in. And as I think you know, my mom passed away earlier this year. Uh, in late February, um, uh, she lived close by, and I was on my way out to see her. We thought she had like six to eight months left. I just put her on hospice, and we had hoped that maybe she'd come back. Uh, right across the hall from her, actually, and I didn't know this. My daughter, Julianne, told me this. Um, was that uh, she had heard from my sister, I don't know what I was hearing, but that right across the hall from my mom, and my mom didn't have the coronavirus, but the first two accounts of the coronavirus in Illinois were right across the hall from my mom in, in Hoffman Estates at this hospital. But contracting the coronavirus, what would it be like? Imagine yourself, because this is what is happening with these false teachers and these demonic, angelic beings. 
and Paul is trying to spare them from this. Consider or imagine for yourself on a human level, in a hospital kind of situation, if you can play with my metaphor, contracting the coronavirus, having to walk to the hospital to get treatment, climbing the stairs to the top floor to get admitted, paying up front to get steamed by the doctor rather than having it billed, finding the doctor to be menacing with no bedside manner and no respirator in sight, then telling you to pay more before her further help would be provided, all the while the grasping of your breath grows worse. That's what these Colossian Christians were facing as they were trying to be sophisticated and as said, it was very similar to what it would be like for us if we had to operate this way. The Colossian church endured something similar in the spiritual realm. Next slide, please. Imagine, and I love this picture of Jesus with this man. This is the physician of our souls. It's what Henry Nouwen might be calling the wounded healer. Uh, but just how this physician of our souls, Jesus is a master healer, so skilled in how he cares both for body and spirit. And he has a great bedside manner. Look no further than Jesus, who makes house calls. I love the fact that my mom's doctor would go and see her back where she lived. Demonstrating medical mastery, Jesus does, and a healing touch with a caring bedside manner. Paying the bill that would, um, that would otherwise bankrupt us because our circumcision is not of the flesh. It's a circumcision of the heart that comes from God and that Jesus provides. He pays the bill that would bankrupt us and he heals us, he helps us so that we can breathe freely again. So whereas these powers, these principalities are saying, obey the law and you do not measure up. That's what they keep telling the Colossian Christians. You don't measure up, ascend, keep going, keep going, keep going. Paul is saying, no, you don't have to keep trying to ascend. Christ has descended to you. And he has taken this law, the good law, but how it's been abused, and he nails it to the cross, and he disarms these principalities and rulers. That's what we had in the text you read in verses 8 through 15, so that we can breathe again. Next slide, please. Now, I can't see that whole slide. I'm not sure what we can do. Can you take it out of um, PowerPoint hold? Uh, mode for some. Thank you, Terry. So, as we move toward conclusion here, we need to cease listening to the voices in our heads and our hearts that would tell us to pay up. I don't know about you, but though I know this stuff pretty well, there are still ways in which I think I try and justify myself, that I try and prove my worth to God rather than accept the worth I have through Jesus in the spirit. But there are voices that play in my head, just like I was concerned about the noise earlier, and I asked Pastor Abe, can you, can you turn off the sound? I was concerned that he would say, well, those voices that you think you're hearing in the background, that's not happening, Paul. It's probably, once again, the voices in your head. But I have voices sometimes that tell me I don't measure up. Maybe you struggle with that. Maybe you sometimes wonder, if you're found pleasing to God. Now, in ourselves, we're not pleasing to God apart from Christ, but we are in Christ, Paul's language. And Paul never got done being grateful that he was the least of the apostles, one abnormally born because he persecuted the church, but he had a debt of gratitude. His whole Christian life was not based on a guilt trip, but gratitude. I wish I had cared for my mom better than I did. People will say I was a good son, but I had people tell me after she died and before, right before she died, be nice to yourself. I had no idea what they meant. Afterwards, I understood because I beat myself up and I could beat myself up about how I feel God. And it's not that I don't want to keep growing and beat my body and make it my slave as making my slave as Paul said in first Corinthians nine, not a faulty form of asceticism, but truly being humble being confident in spirit, keeping my eye on Christ. I've got to be like an athlete, keeping my eyes on Christ, 1 Corinthians 9. But I should live a life of gratitude, not guilt trip, keeping my eyes on Christ. My mom would want me to know her love for me 
not to beat myself up. How much more so with Christ? And I'm trying to use concrete examples to bring this point home to all of us today. Next week, we're going to talk about other spirits that might be present, a little different from Paul's spirits in his day, but I'm going to try and apply it even more to our context next week, having dealt with some of the heavy lifting theologically this week. We need to, now if here, you can go back to that, please, the PowerPoint mode. Thank you, as we close up here today. Back to the PowerPoint, please. That, that mode. Stop breathing in those spirits who would fill our lungs with fluid, like with pneumonia, until we choke to death or have cardiac arrest. We need to listen to God's word, which tells us who Jesus is, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Are we lost in wonder, as Paul was, with the fullness of Christ, for what he has done, for who he is, for what he has done, and who you are I in him through God's spirit? May we fill our lungs with his spirit, not the poisonous fluids that would lead to a loss of respiratory fullness of life. Remember that all the fullness of deity dwells in Jesus, and you've been given fullness in him. Next week, we'll talk about further how to conquer the spiritual equivalent of this coronavirus, and we'll reflect upon these spirit principles and how they manifest themselves today in our age, and how we were to respond and guard against contracting or setting about to recover from the spiritual respiratory disease known as the Colossian heresy today.